Okay, everyone is already in. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is February 11th. This is United Medical ACO, uh, our weekly event. Um, again, today is February 11th, uh, Friday. Uh, we have uh, different topics. Uh, we are going to give you COVID update. Uh, before we start with uh, our COVID update, uh, of course, um, uh, just to kind of lighten up the uh, week, we have new stuff going on every week related to COVID. COVID is impacting our lives uh, different uh, in different ways, and uh, and today is uh, I think our cartoon is up there. Uh, yeah. So for this week's uh, cartoon, uh, we are incorporating the Beijing twenty twenty two Winter Olympics. Um, so far. Off to a pretty good start. Things seem to be going relatively smoothly, um, but obviously the coronavirus is still kind of lurking and impacting uh, the event a little bit. Um, some of the participants or other officials, athletes that are actually testing positive are going into these quarantines while they're there, um, hopefully able to then eventually test negative to rejoin the, uh, the larger population in the um, athlete's village. That way they can remingle with the a safe population. And um, so we kind of just have the coronavirus guy. He's still hanging out there, has his impact on the uh, Olympics. And then on the next slide. Um, They're not having a really good time there, right? No, uh, they have. So the ones that are unfortunately testing positive, like I said, they're in that quarantine. So they're isolated from the rest of the main uh, athlete population, obviously, to prevent the spread. Um, but the ones who are in the quarantine are having a uh, like you said, a little bit difficult time. They have no internet. They're complaining of uh, bad food, uh, bad food, inadequate room and housing. And it's kind of um, not up to par on what you'd expect. Um, but hopefully, like I said, when they do then retest negative, they're able to rejoin. And obviously the conditions there are much better than in the quarantine. So it's kind of just a little lurking issue we have with the Olympics and Corona. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, in case, uh, Sean, uh, if you are wondering why I'm uh, kind of not fully focused, is because uh, I have the live on one side mm -hmm. and I hide the non participants. Um, it doesn't happen. So I can kind of see uh, exactly what's happening uh, gotcha. real time. So that's kind of confusing me on one side. So I'm going to stop to that. Slightly delayed. Like the, on the live one, the non participants are showing up. So we were able to figure it out last week somehow. Uh, uh, it will it will work. Yeah. So, Trial and error. We'll see. Right. Keep so, on going. All right. Now we have uh, our COVID updates. Uh, we can actually look at the um, overall country updates first. Um, Get to that real quick. So yeah, uh, with the United States overall update, um, again, we have Delaware on the side column there uh, comparing the percentages of those vaccinated. So overall for the nation as a whole, we're up over 213 million now, um, steadily increasing. And then those who have the booster are over 90 and a half million, again, steadily increasing, uh, increasing there. So if you're looking at Delaware, uh, it's gonna be in the uh, margin to the right-hand side. Again, it's highest in the population over age 65, because we know at the initial start of the vaccine um, availability, it was given to those uh, who are of older age and then nursing homes are more vulnerable and at more at risk. So that population is still uh, overall leading those who are uh, fully vaccinated. And then just looking at the total, um, comparing Delaware to the country as a whole, for those who are total uh, fully vaccinated, uh, we have 64.2% for the population as a whole. And then Delaware is at 61.6%, so a little bit behind the nation's average. In terms of the, um, one of the, um, I think the really important um, uh, comparison that we have is if um, we were able to do what um, uh, what Denmark did. I know Denmark, like I actually don't like these types of comparisons because well, Denmark is a very small country, but in terms of the ratio of uh, vaccination, if uh, we were able to do what Denmark did, uh, so this slide um, shows us 
our hospitalization rate, um, the one in red versus uh, Denmark is the one in blue. So that's the big gap there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like you said, uh, it's it's a a good comparison to look at, but there are obviously multiple variables and other factors that would uh, contribute to the actual statistics that we're finding there, like you said, country size and obviously diversity of the different geographic regions, obviously the U.S. being much larger and having um, a lot more variables to factor in there. But overall, the message of, yeah, had uh, acted a little bit sooner and a little bit more aggressively that the numbers maybe not as low as Denmark's are shown in this uh, visual, but definitely could have been lower than what we're showing in the red uh, overall for our country. All right, so um, now today is a uh, important day for those um, at least who live in Delaware. Uh, so the indoor mask mandate is uh, over uh, at the end of today, actually. Uh, so that is going to be uh, that's still going to be required as school, right? Um, yeah, so the mask mandate, um, I know you said, I believe it was 8 a.m. is when it started, but by the end of the day, it will be officially over for um, adults in your public settings. So gyms, uh, I know tennis, like you said, that's a big one for you. So no more mask there. Um, but your grocery stores, any of your public uh, areas there. In school, they were mentioning that for Delaware, it would be the end of March that they're going to require the mask to remain on tentatively. It would be uh, removed end of March. But again, that could change. Um, we still have another month and a half or so to reach that point. All right. So right now, uh, you know, I'm trying one other thing just because, um, again, I'm getting messages from our people. Uh, just to see how this impacts. And there's a little bit delay on YouTube. Uh, since we have this new uh, method we are trying, so it's uh, now at this point when I hide um, the uh, non-video participants. Um, so this should be showing us only three videos. Let's see if that works. And best is, best keeps texting me. Whatever you did is working. Nope. So it didn't get there for whatever reason. Um, uh, so I'm able to uh, make the most, mm, I don't know. So one more try, okay, so then it, and I won't bother after this one. Yes, it's, I don't know if you're watching that uh, on the live side, but yeah, I think we got it. Except that the order is wrong. I can see on my screen, I keep flip-flopping with our visual, so. Yeah. I know the viewers come here to see my face a lot, so hopefully. You know, the, um, so the, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I'm making a mistake on them. Uh, I thought the host was, uh, yeah, this is the host. Okay. Mm. Um, all right, so we, it's, um, that's all I can do, so then we don't want to lose too much time on this. So, um, now on the vaccination, I think that's all we have. Uh, now, it's, we know that it's slowed down, um, like other people are not getting uh, vaccinated. Um, we also know that... Um, we have uh, more uh, people who are uh, getting their booster done and then first shot is being less. Uh, those are all fine. So I think um, part of the uh, part of the issue from today, I mean, from this time and on is like the season is almost over. So then hopefully we are going to be able to get through this with less um, problems. But today, um, 
we do actually have a guest speaker and as we are trying to have every other week, we have a new topic that we are trying to discuss um, on the clinical side. Uh, sleep apnea is another issue with the COPD uh, related problems. And um, our Katie Yellowman from uh, United Medical Clinic is gonna be with us. So at this time, I'm gonna ask them to join us. Um, if they can, uh, Donna Gunkel as well as. Hi guys, thanks for having me today. Hey, hey yeah. how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, so now, yeah, you know, we are trying to do this new stuff. Um, so, and I like in front of my, uh, what I have in front of me is like a, uh, it's like an airplane. So it's not complicated. So <laughs> we are getting there. So the problem is, when I see it's not following on the line, uh, uh, what I have on my laptop is not being followed through, then uh, it's a little bit confusing, but I think uh, there's some stuff that we are mixing, uh, we are missing. So how are you doing? Good, yeah, things are going well. All right, Beautiful so day outside today, lots of sunshine. It is, so uh, we, we are trying to do these clinical topics for our patients who may be watching this, um, uh, we have the new, uh, almost like the new cycling for these events. Uh, we have different uh, providers who are part of the event and thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I know you prepared some uh, PowerPoint uh, slides with us. And then there are a couple of questions maybe after that we are gonna have and uh, let me make sure that, so this, I can share, all right, okay. Um, okay, great. So I'm Katie Galvan. I'm a physician assistant here at United Medical Clinic. Um, and I've been here for a little over a year now. Um, and I do see a lot of patients with both COPD and I see a lot of patients with um, obstructive sleep apnea. So I'm excited to talk about it today. Um, so the first disorder we're gonna talk about today is COPD, which stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, and that's a lung disease that causes obstructive airflow and difficulty breathing in patients. Um, so most of the time this leads to symptoms like a chronic cough, which um, can be both productive with mucus or just a dry cough, um, shortness of breath, wheezing, and then frequent respiratory infections. So most of the time when we see um, patients coming in, it is due to their chronic cough or um, shortness of breath that's been there for a while. Now the main risk factor for COPD is cigarette smoking. About 90% of patients with COPD um, have it due to cig cigarette smoking, either a current history or past history. Um, but you can also get COPD from exposure to secondhand smoke, exposure to um, um, workplace exposures, and then also um, a pretty rare genetic disease called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is um, you, when you're lacking a protein in your body to help protect your lungs against damaging factors. Um, so COPD is diagnosed with pulmonary function testing or lung function testing. Um, and that's when your provider will send you to a lab and you'll breathe into a tube that's connected to a machine and it measures um, how strongly your lungs can blow out air and how quickly and how much air you can hold in your lungs. Um, and based on that, if it shows, you know, that you have any kind of damage in your lungs, it, you might be diagnosed with COPD. Um, so there are two types of COPD, um, emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So we can see in our picture here um, that the lung on the left is healthy and then the lung on the right has COPD. Um, and the bottom picture, which looks like an air sac, is an alveoli. Um, and that would be with emphysema when the alveoli become damaged from frequent exposure to cigarette smoke. Um, they can't, uh, they're not as elastic and they can't get rid of the extra trapped air. So the air becomes trapped in there and then the good, healthy, oxygenated air can't make it down to the air sacs and that um, then your capillaries can't absorb the oxygen. 
And then the other side of that is chronic bronchitis, um, which is when we have excessive mucus in the airways. And because of all that mucus, you have a really narrowed airway and you can't get in air or out as well. And a lot of times you have actually a combination of both of them. So it's not just that you have emphysema or chronic bronchitis, but you can have both. Um, so you did your pulmonary function testing, your healthcare provider diagnosed, diagnosed you with COPD. Um, so how do we treat it? And COPD isn't curable, but it is treatable. And if you're currently smoking and you have COPD, the best thing you can do is quit. And we have so much help available. Your healthcare provider really wants you to help quit. Um, so if you've quit in the past ever at all, and even if you're still smoking, you know, there's always help in every attempt to quit is one step closer to quitting for good. Um, so we have patches, pills, gums, lozenges, um, lots of different options to help you quit. So definitely talk to your provider about um, trying to quit smoking when you're ready. And then you can always call the Delaware quit line too. And they have um, lots of resources available, including a coach that can help you through the whole process. Um, and they can prescribe medication as well. Um, so then hopefully once you quit smoking, that'll reverse the, the chronic damage to the lungs. And then we also treat COPD with inhalers. Um, so you might be prescribed a short acting bronchodilator, which is a medic an inhaler that you take just as needed. Um, and that relaxes the airway and allows you to breathe more easily. You might also be prescribed a long acting bronchodilator, um, which you take twice a day and then that prevents some of your symptoms. Um, you can also take inhaled steroids and then you can take um, a combination of both of those and there are many other inhalers as well. Uh, one of the things you can do is pulmonary rehab, which is when you go to therapy and they teach you um, exercise, they um, educate you on breathing techniques and um, things that you can do yourself to help kind of prevent the, the progression of COPD. So pulmonary rehab is really good at improving your quality of life um, and improving how much activity you're able to do. And then if the COPD is really severe, a lot of times people do need oxygen. Um, so they can take a portable oxygen concentrator around with them if they get um, low oxygen when they're doing activity. And then if the COPD is really severe and it's not treatable with, um, with the bronchodilators and the inhalers and, and the pulmonary rehab and the oxygen, sometimes you might need surgery to remove a part of the lung that's damaged so that the good lung um, still has room to expand. Now, anytime you have an exacerbation or a flare up of COPD, um, you wanna be put on oral steroids to decrease the inflammation in your lungs. And then we'll also most likely prescribe antibiotics or azithromycin um, to, to try to um, kill any bacterial infection in the lungs as well. One of the best ways to prevent exacerbations is to get vaccinated. So just like we were talking about earlier with COVID, if everyone got vaccinated, um, you know, the, the hospitalizations and the deaths and mortality and all the complications related to COVID would be so much lower. So I tell everybody, get your COVID vaccine. Um, and then you also want to get your pneumonia vaccine. And then you also want to get your flu vaccine every year. And these are going to prevent um, some of the, you know, the most common um, flare things that cause flare ups of COPD. And then know when to seek further treatment. So if your COPD isn't controlled with your um, current inhalers that you're using and you're having a lot more symptoms, talk to your provider. You may need step-up therapy, meaning more um, intense inhalers to help control your symptoms. Or if you're having really severe symptoms like severe worsening shortness of breath, chest pain, a low oxygen percentage, or you're coughing off a lot of mucus that's more than usual or a different kind of color or consistency, you may need to go to the hospital. Um, to get emergency treatment. So our goal of treating COPD is to um, improve your quality of life, um, decrease the damage that's happening to your lungs, um, and then decrease the symptoms so that you know you can live a, a life that's symptom free, or at least um, a better life. Um, and then the other disease we're going to talk about today is obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and sleep apnea is when the airway is repeatedly, repeatedly blocked during sleep um, and then the person stops breathing. 
and it's blocked because of um, the excess tissue in the throat, which could be the tongue or um, the tonsils or the uvula. Um, and then because of that, the patient um, can't get enough air and the body has to wake itself up to, um, to, to breathe again. So when you're frequently waking up, you're not gonna get restful sleep. And that would, that's what causes the main symptoms of sleep apnea. So most of the time people notice fatigue, like they're really tired during the day um, and they could easily fall asleep, whether they're at work or they're watching TV or even if they're driving. Um, and then they might notice a morning headache as well because your oxygen is low at night. You're not getting enough oxygen to the brain and you're having a headache when you wake up. Um, and then some of the signs that other people might notice is um, a lot of times a person's sleeping partner will notice that they snore really loudly, that they stop breathing at night and then gasp themselves awake because you as the person with sleep apnea might not actually uh, wake up, might not, not, might not remember that you're waking up. Um, and then a lot of times patients have obesity and they have an enlarged neck circumference. Um, so most of the time when patients are coming in and we're concerned for sleep apnea, it's because they're really tired during the day. They're saying they're not sleeping well, and they're saying that their sleeping partner is um, annoyed with all their loud snoring. And most of the um, patients with sleep apnea are um, men who are obese, and they're over the age of 60. However, because that's the typical clinical picture that we see, we do miss some sleep apnea typically in women or in younger people. Um, so just because you don't fit that typical clinical picture doesn't mean you don't have sleep apnea. If you're still having these symptoms, you should bring it up to your um, provider. And then some of the medical conditions that are associated with sleep apnea include um, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, heart disease, heart failure, AFib or an irregular heartbeat, um, stroke and depression. And a lot of times treating sleep apnea um, can help completely resolve these or it can improve them and, and you might not need so much treatment for your other conditions. And then uh, one of the things that we do when you're in the office is your provider will do a sleep apnea screen. Um, so they're gonna ask you some of these basic questions that we talked about, like if you're really tired or fatigued during the day, if you've been told that you snore a lot, if you have high blood pressure, which is associated with sleep apnea, um, and if you have a high BMI or you're obese, and if you're over the age of 50. Um, and if this screening for sleep apnea is positive, that's when we wanna start treatment for it. Um, and that's when we wanna you know, do a sleep study and, and see if you do have sleep apnea. So how is sleep apnea diagnosed? Um, so the um, gold standard diagnosis for sleep apnea is nocturnal polysomnography in a sleep lab. Um, so this is when we'll send you to a sleep lab overnight and they test your breathing and they test your heart rate, um, your oxygen percentage, and see if you are having episodes where you stop breathing and if your oxygen goes too low at night. However, that's more complicated and a lot of times patients prefer to do a home sleep study where we just send a kit to your home and then um, at, they, you just sleep in your own bed. One night they, we test you know, your breathing, oxygen, um, heart rate, all that good stuff and that can diagnose sleep apnea. It's not quite as accurate, but it's still highly accurate at, at diagnosing sleep apnea. And then, um, so your sleep study comes back positive and then what do we do? We treat it from there. So one of the best things you can do um, to help treat sleep apnea naturally is to reduce your weight. Um, and anytime you're losing weight, that's um, decreasing the amount of um, excess body fat that's putting pressure um, on your throat and that could be causing more obstruction at night. So if we can relieve that, um, that often helps with, with the sleep apnea. Um, but the most common treatment and the best treatment for sleep apnea is a CPAP machine. And that stands for continuous positive airway pressure, um, which is, you can see it in this picture. It's a machine that goes over your nose and it pushes air into your nose while you're sleeping so that your nasal passages and your airway don't completely close up at night. Um, so this is a, a very effective method for treating sleep apnea. And then you can also use an oral appliance, which is like a mouth guard and it keeps your jaw forward and it keeps your airway open at night 
so that um, you're not having periods where it's blocked. And the oral appliance isn't as effective as the CPAP machine, but it is um, still a good option if people can't tolerate the CPAP machine or if they really don't want to. Um, and then one of the newer options, which is pretty cool, is the implant. So what they do is they um, surgically implant a device that is connected to um, the nerve that stimulates your tongue. So when, it, when you, um, the sensor notices that you stop breathing and then your oxygen is low, it stimulates the tongue to move forward in the throat and then that opens up the airway. And again, I, that needs some more research before we're um, like regularly recommending that for patients, but I think that's the future of sleep apnea treatment. Um, and then we can also do surgery and that would remove your uvula or your tonsils or some of the excess tissue that could be causing um, a blockage while you're sleeping. And then it has been shown that CPAP can um, significantly decrease um, your blood pressure, your risk of um, abnormal heart rhythms, stroke, heart failure, and heart attack if you're using it consistently. Um, so if you've been prescribed that sleep apnea machine, definitely use it. And it does have mixed results. Only a, like less than half of patients still use a CPAP machine two years after they're prescribed it. Um, just because a lot of people have difficulty getting used to it right away. But once people are used to it, patients often report that it helps improve their sleep drastically. They feel so much more awake during the day. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of patients tell me that they love their sleep apnea machine, their CPAP machine, and um, it, it really improves their quality of life. Um, and then something I found interesting, um, and Kamal, I think you'll like this, is that bariatric surgery improves the outcomes in obese patients. So um, I have seen patients who have had a CPAP machine for a long time, and they've, um, they've been obese for a long time. And then once they get bariatric surgery and they lose a significant amount of weight, they don't need their CPAP machine anymore and they don't have those symptoms of sleep apnea anymore. So it, the, the bariatric surgery and significant weight loss really can drastically um, improve you know, your, um, your sleep apnea. And um, our goal of treating sleep apnea is to pre prevent these complications and to improve your sleep and then to make sure that you're you know, more awake during the day and, and can live like a happy full life. So, um, well, Katie, this, is, uh, this topic is extremely important. So from primary care point, uh, primary care level, um, I think uh, you mentioned the bariatric and um, uh, when, uh, when we do the case conferences on a daily basis, uh, one of the, um, you know, like certain terms are just um, uh, it's embedded in, in my head. So uh, HSD, the home sleep kit, um, and then prior to that, getting the stop bank score. Like it was kind of funny when I heard it first time, stop, stop bank score. Like it didn't sound like medical. So uh, that was for the sleep apnea. So um, if we were to talk about that a little bit, um, uh, and you mentioned uh, earlier, but just specifically, just a lot of primary care offices, uh, when we look at it, they don't actually use that are specific forms. Uh, and patients may not know because like, once they are actually identified as, uh, like if their um, stop bank score is over four, they should definitely be sent for a uh, home sleep study um, and then they should be followed up by uh, pulmonary, even if they don't have uh, morbid obesity. So I know uh, it, uh, my angle is coming from the morbid obesity side, but I think we see a lot of benefits of those patients getting care. If, even some of them, they don't complete the surgery process, but they end up getting their pulmonary uh, care. Um, if you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So these are screening questionnaires to ask patients basically um, some of the most common symptoms associated with sleep apnea and some of the risk factors. So if we can identify that the patient has the most common um, risk factors or symptoms of sleep apnea, there's a high likelihood that you do have sleep apnea and we want to get, um, a, you know, a diagnostic test right away and treatment right away. So anytime that you are coming into our office for these symptoms, we should do these screening tests and, and you know, we should use 
um, the, the stop bang score or the we have the sleep apnea screen to, to make sure that you, um, you know, are qualifying for most of the, the um, symptoms that could indicate sleep apnea. You know, the, uh, one, one of the, um, you, know, you know, Dr. Irgao um, uh, with our bariatric program. So certain things he explains to me from the clinical side. And I, once I understand from him, then I never forget. And then I can explain it to other people better. So then so in our surgery center, people have to use um, CPAP. Uh, they have to be on a CPAP machine, especially with our bariatric patients. So um, I never understood that for why it wasn't required for every surgery, but it was specifically for bariatric. And as you mentioned, bariatric, uh, the sleep, uh, sleep apnea is more common. But the, what's happening during the sleep, and I was explaining to Sean yesterday when why we picked this, and this is one of our chronic care management approach, uh, one of the six that uh, Donna and I work with the team. Uh, so. People pretty much, um, people with uh, sleep apnea, they stop uh, breathing uh, at the point where their highest snoring is the time where their brain is telling them to wake up. And, and in the recovery of the surgery, that part, because if it's right under the, after the anesthesia, then they, the brain doesn't function the way it's supposed to be. So then it's not telling them to wake up. So then that's kind of like how uh, why it's so important to have that breathing machine there available for the for these patients, but it actually is uh, also important for those patients who doesn't have who don't have um, sleep apnea. Now, uh, one of the other thing, and I'm actually kind of guilty of not sleeping well. Um, I do have my own sleeping problems, but um, people with weight gain, uh, and I'm not talking about morbid obesity now. I'm just talking about a regular. Uh, um, BMI level, or maybe just uh, slightly overweight, not sleeping enough, not having good quality sleep does impact your weight gain uh, in a really uh, drastic way. So uh, actually one of the studies that um, this article is telling, uh, it's actually, it's, it's uh, from the JAMA uh, Internal Medicine uh, uh, it's just published recently, and it is uh, talking about like increasing the uh, sleep. Uh, just one hour does uh, uh, cut the calorie intake by 270 calories, which uh, has its own um, you know balance there. So it's really important for people to know that they need to sleep properly and uh, they need to have a good quality sleep. So and we are here to help them, and and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, Donna, absolutely. Did you have anything uh, to add, Donna? I don't know. You're a little bit quiet today. <laughs> I know. Well, Katie did such a great job. Um, no, I think the only thing I did want to maybe uh, mention or ask you a little bit about, Katie, is sometimes I know patients may ask um, if their symptoms during the day, like if they feel like they have a little bit of uh, trouble breathing um, during the day. Um, if that is a side effect or a cause of their sleep apnea at night? I would say most times during the day, people aren't having so much obstruction just because um, like they're not lying down and, and their brain can still like stimulate the, the respiratory passages to open up if they're not getting enough oxygen. So I would say the main symptom during the day is, is mostly just the, the fatigue and the sleepiness. Um, but I would say a lot of times during the day, people don't have as much trouble breathing. It's mostly at night. And of course, those people who snore, they always deny that they snore. So uh, it's, <laughs> like with them. it's true. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, they'll just like casually bring up, oh, my wife or husband is always mad at me because I'm always snoring. But it, it actually can be a sign of a pretty serious disorder. So, you know, that's why if you're having all these symptoms, it, it's definitely good to get it checked out. Absolutely. Well, uh, Katie, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to move on to our next topic. And uh, I apologize for uh, the cutoff on the top of the screen, but we'll do a better job next time. So um, the uh, telehealth uh, 
waiver uh, for through 2024. Uh, this is what um, Congress is being asked. Uh, MGMA is um, uh, advocating for this. Um, uh, I know uh, Anthony Anubu is probably watching this as well. So we are putting a lot of effort from uh, Delaware um, standpoint and uh, our providers and our community here. Problem is, uh, Tele telehealth should not be uh, utilized for the crisis. Um, so it should be one of the standards that we have in healthcare. So right now we are actually asking um, um, Congress uh, and we are gonna reach out to our people there. But the problem is that should not be even the case. So then they should be doing this because why do we need to have big pandemics in order to follow the right thing? So uh, telehealth actually did save lives uh, throughout the pandemic already. And then we have good standards. And as I always say, we did actually wanted to, um, uh, we wanted to have a good standard for that but this doesn't mean that um, uh, they should actually make it um, temporary. So they really do need to make this uh, permanent and hopefully we can, uh, we can see that um, uh, from our, uh, from our uh, Congress and our, our people. So that is um, uh, our update from uh, the telehealth. Uh, Sean, did you want to add anything there? No, I mean, just uh, in a more general speaking, um, like you're saying, to have that become a more permanent and normal uh, factor of healthcare. And, you know, on the convenience side, um, I think it would definitely, it, it seems that the benefits outweigh any, if they even exist at all, any, you know, downside to having the telehealth. So um, if you look at all the data, like in, in that article, it did present some of the data that they were presenting to Congress. And Overall, it just seems like a like a no brainer that uh, it's definitely beneficial and should continue. Sure, and um, now the this thing uh, the not, the one that I'm about to share is really interesting. Let's see if I don't know if I did get the right picture. I don't see it. Um, this is about the uh, Biden administration um, handouts pay smoking kids. So. Now, I know I have it, let's see. All right, I know I had it and I have it right here. So now um, this is interesting and it's actually important. This is totally misunderstood uh, by, um, uh, by society. Uh, so now, um, Sean, uh, what was your take on this one when you first saw it? I know, I know we actually discussed this yesterday, and I, you, uh, I told you what my take was, and right. maybe there was some education there too, but um, uh, yeah. a couple of comments on this. Yeah, so uh, initially, um, it was actually kind of, not go necessarily going viral, but uh, kind of popular on uh, Instagram. It's kind of where I was initially introduced to it, and uh, a lot of people having their initial um reaction and immediate what they presumed was happening and what they thought they kind of made sense of the story uh, in their head to what made sense to them. Um, so a lot of the public initially thought that the program is uh, in, in a sense funding uh, crack pipes to be, to be handed out to the public, um, which would be promoting drug use, you know, and obviously an interesting so I just uh, want to give you guys a little bit uh, background on this one. So just because um, the time wise, uh, it's almost 3 p.m. So, uh, and I do want to get into the Web3 discussion. Um, now, uh, Sean, our discussion yesterday regarding this was interesting, right? So you probably, you didn't have any idea that I had that experience what I discussed with you. So there's a, com uh, there's a state committee called CRT. Um, this is a um, community response team. Uh, so I was, I'm part of it still uh, as of today. Uh, I've been participating uh, almost in the last four or five years. And the thing is, um, um, <laughs> so I didn't know when I, my, my, my first meeting, I didn't know why I was there. 
So community response team is, uh, uh, the entire goal is to prevent the overdose. When you are trying to prevent the overdose, um, then you have to make certain things available for those who, who have addiction problem. So, and when I saw this uh, post uh, from, um, I think it was on Twitter uh, the, in the news, uh, it's not, if you really understand how the system works, it's not, um, it's not crazy. Uh, it is actually, perhaps it's the right thing to do because when you make certain things available, uh, because these people have addiction problem, and it's a deeper discussion than what it is that we can do today. Uh, it needs to be understood properly. So the issue is those people, yes, they do need help. They do need to get uh, proper help. Uh, but while they are getting that, we don't want people to overdose. So that's what this is about. So it's making it safer so that until maybe they can get proper help, they at least don't overdose. No one wants to lose their family member just because they have drug addiction doesn't mean that they need to die on the street. On the street. So this is what this is about. Now, uh, you can discuss the uh, financial uh, part of it, the, the prior to of it, the dollar amount of it, all those are fine. But uh, the from the social responsibility and what the government should be doing with some of these people, it is the proper way to approach it. So, um, and knowing this more from the uh, Delaware standpoint, understanding uh, what overdose prevention issue is, um, this is not what's understood by public. So people need to really understand this better before they can actually make more comments. So um, that was kind of like, uh, honestly, it was a little bit annoying when I see some of the comments from people, they just make, um, you know, just stupid comments. So then hopefully people can understand a little bit better. Now, so we probably need to, <laughs> next week, um, we probably need to get into some of these, um, uh, and as we are working on this transition, uh, our format is changing. Uh, so the, uh, we are trying to, with the Neuralink, we are, right now what we are working on is uh, a provider survey, um, provider specific with our physicians, our nurse practitioners and our physician assistants. Uh, we are customizing questions for providers specifically and trying to get some clinical background on this issue. And hopefully uh, it will be ready by, um, uh, by mid-March, I would say. So um, uh, the idea is um, we want to really uh, study this. We want to get into this. We want to help Elon Musk. Uh, although Elon Musk did not call us yet. I know that he's going to call us. Uh, I know he has like six kids and a lot of responsibilities and he's probably um, uh, busy, uh, but uh, he also answers a lot of uh, unnecessary tweets. Um, and we can say Tesla, so we don't have a problem with saying Tesla. So hoping that we can get in touch. But I think this partnership may be fruitful uh, and uh, we are gonna have our providers input. Uh, we did our public survey uh, and knowing that 50, more than 50% almost um, people who are interested in uh, some part of Neuralink, uh, implementing Neuralink in their own body. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I may be one of those people. So I'm not uh, afraid of that. But apparently monkeys are in trouble. So, and we don't want to hurt the monkeys, but um, this is now, there's some bad, bad publicity apparently. And I don't know how true it is. It's not so, we're going to discuss this a little bit more uh, and it's coming up. And now uh, we are going to study a little bit more and I promise we'll do this, but next week uh, we are going to get into the Web3 discussion. So Sean and I, we are, uh, um, uh, getting into the little bit more to better understand. Uh, yeah, impact in slowly learning, but obviously day by day, I think we're getting a little bit more comfortable and learning more each, each day. But yeah, there's a lot to grasp. Um, but, you know, as I said, the more research and uh, information that we're getting on it, the more comfortable and uh, easier it'll be for us to kind of convey what the whole Web3 is about. So just so that we have a, a placeholder for next week and we can do a 
and hopefully better time management. But um, uh, I've been talking about this uh, for a long time. Uh, U.S. Uh, national uh, debt is over 30 trillion. Many of you, uh, hopefully, if you are paying attention, I've been talking about this. In, uh, at the end of 2019, uh, this number was 22 trillion. Uh, since uh, then, uh, 2021, so we are in two years, I believe. So this is eight trillion uh, more. This means um, inflation. Uh, this means um, uh, I mean, I see financial trouble um, with this because there's no um, way we can actually substantiate this. So there's, um, uh, when you don't have something and then you are spending it, that is uh, problematic. So that's going to come back to us. So I do want people to be more uh, careful and be aware of what's coming. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a real true uh, case, true issue. And we are hoping that uh, people would be paying attention and understanding why I'm actually talking about these things. Now, I don't, the, the goal is not just because I told you so, it's just because I want you to be prepared. So, um, and this is because this is coming. So, um, well, we have the bariatric Friday in five minutes. Uh, I know Dr. Ergao is waiting on the other side. So we'll be back in five uh, until next week. Uh, stay safe. So the mask is uh, for the indoor is over for end of today. So um, we'll have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.